Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the last day of our Nature for Life hop. We cannot believe the last day of the hop is upon us already. What an incredible few days it has been. For our first breakfast session of the day, we will tune into a conversation led by Youth for Nature around the youth call to action on nature-based solutions and beyond. Please enjoy the breakfast session of day four, youth taking action on nature-based solutions, listening to and learning from youth from the margins of the center stage. Enjoy. We hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe during these tough times. My name is Scout Pronto Breslin, a high school student from the U.S., and I'm here with my colleague, Kaluki Paul Matuku from Kenya. We are representatives of Youth for Nature, a youth-led international organization that educates, empowers, and mobilizes young people to lead on solutions to the ecological and climate crises that are ambitious, backed by science, and grounded in justice. We're so excited to be part of the Nature for Life Hub and to hear from and elevate youth around the world who are leading work on nature-based solutions and from a variety of angles. We expect to have a rich and inspiring exchange of experiences, ideas, and look forward to the participation of our audience online. For a bit of reflection before we hear from our speakers, please join us for a short video from Indigenous Communities Defund, Forest, Defund Deforestation. State Street, Black Rock, Vanguard. As empresas que você investe, que você financia, estão queimando nossos bosques. Companies you own are taking our lands. As empresas que vocês financiam estão ameaçando nossas vidas. You have the power to make them stop burning down our forests. You have the power de evitar que sigan amenazando nuestras vidas. Respect the rights of indigenous peoples. Respect the rights of indigenous peoples. Respecter les droits des peuples tout en monde. Respecte los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Pare de financiar o desmatamento. Agora. No más fondo para la deforestación. Ahora. Defund deforestation. Now. Allow me to take you through a bit of why this session is happening today and why it's important to listen to all of us who are joining in, especially the speakers and new participants. So nature-based solutions is a term has gained momentum in 2019, but as controversies around its, its use and co-opting have come up, it still gets to the mainstream agenda to date. Youth have led local initiatives and created pro-nature, pro-people programs in their communities. Big oil and corporations have taken advantage of this and tokenized youth action and use of the term. But today, we choose to stand for nature with these global youth leaders and change makers to put a spotlight on the in initiative to protect, restore, and sustainably manage nature. These are among the hope for a future pushing beyond their limits to ensure a nature for life, future for people and for the planet. Together, they remind us that nature-based solutions is only a part of the solution and not the only solution, that we need both nature-based solutions, but we also need rapid decarbonization for a nature positive gas recovery. They show us the power of youth action and challenges our world leaders, and they challenge our world leaders to style up or step down. Enough of the world we don't want to see, and yes to the world that we, want, we need to see. We choose to listen to them and to learn from them, from indigenous youth to youth restoration scientists, and youth policy leaders. This is said to be an, a catalyst session for, by, and with youth. And to kick us off with this inspiring section, Kayan Tega from Indonesia, who use, uses filmmaking to preserve and protect indigenous communities. Welcome Kayan, and please share with us why it matters to amplify the voices of indigenous communities for nature-based solutions. Uh, thank you, thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Kiran Tegar. I'm 15 years old and a photographer and also a filmmaker from West Borneo, Indonesia. So through my films, through my photos, I try to help preserve the culture of my people, the Daya Iban tribe in my small village, Sungai Utik. 
why this culture is so important to to us, to me, to my community and the world is that this culture, through this culture, they have survived on their land for hundreds and even thousands mm -hmm. of years, the indigenous people. And for all of those times, the land is still is still plentiful. Their forest is still teeming with life. But over the course of the last 50 or so years, specifically in my area, deforestation, land clearing for farmer plantation has wreaked havoc and caused so many of the communities here to lose their culture because they no longer have any forest left. And this is why I try with my films to preserve that and also to share it and to share the many, many cultural values. Many, many cultural values many cultural values because yes. um, through that they have preserved their forests for so long and also one other way that our community can show how to protect nature is the fact that they have preserved 9,000 more than 9,000 hectares of primary forests from any outside interest from coming in and it was difficult the temptations of the money and also the brute force that was sometimes used by by these companies that are supported by the government sometimes. One of the ways that we can fight that now is to help indigenous communities everywhere in, in Indonesia, in the Amazon, everywhere to gain their land rights because um, it was scientifically proven that indigenous communities that has had their land rights recognized are multiple, multiple times better at protecting the forest. And I think that's that would be my message for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next up, we'd like to introduce Aman Sharma, a climate justice activist. Aman, can you tell us about how intersectionality and nature-based solutions are connected? Mm -hmm. Next up, we'd like to introduce Aman Sharma, a youth climate justice activist. Um, Aman, can you tell us about how intersectionality and nature-based solutions are connected? Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak over here. Uh, I think the entire climate justice comes to my people, my country, uh, nation. I'm actually a resident of New Delhi, which is the capital city of India. Yes, that's right. And as a lot of you may know, New Delhi is actually the most polluted city in the world for a good amount of the year. We have around level fifteen thousand, and it gets really, really hard to stay in the city when that happens. And the lockdown that a lot of you are experiencing, or the masks that a lot of you are having to wear across the world because of the pandemic right now, are not just a situation, but a reality for us every single year where our schools, our offices, our workplaces are shut down because of the rising levels of pollution. And we need to wear masks to even want to step out of our homes. Um, and I feel that is when I realized the importance of climate justice, not just climate action, and also the importance of generational and societal equity. Because I feel that the real progress can happen only when all sections of society move forward together. Yes, it's true that climate change is an issue that is in the long run probably going to affect all of us equally, um, some more than the others, but at an equitable level. But I feel that immediately there are people who are on the front lines of this crisis who are facing its effects much more so than a lot of other people who are more privileged. And most of those people are concentrated either in marginalized communities or global South countries. And I feel that is why intersectionality is so truly important, not just in climate movements like Fridays for Future, but also in climate discussions. And I'm so happy to see so many people representing so many different communities over here today, because this is what is needed. We need to move forward together with every single one of us, with all the voices of people of color and uh, the weaker strata of society truly getting the representation that they haven't gotten yet in international climate discussions. Be it youth 
who don't really have a say in the decisions that truly affect our future yet, be it people who are living on the brinks of society, be it people, our indigenous people who are living within the forests. It's all about giving everyone their voice, their representation and their chance to reflect what climate change is impacting in their own local communities on the ground level. Thank you, Aman, for that. And so inspiring already to hear from uh, indigenous communities and youth who are already leading action there to intersectionality and how we can all be part of the solution. And now we want to move on to young um, uh, restoration scientists who are doing some amazing work from their countries. And so next up is Elena Teklu. Helena is a young entrepreneur using our project Seed Bombs Ethiopia to restore landscapes and solve food insecurities in our country, Ethiopia. We are honored to have you today, Helena. So kindly share with us why landscape restoration should be viewed as a sustainable economic opportunity for youth and for our communities. So could you kindly share with us why landscape restoration should be viewed as a sustainable economic opportunity for youth and for communities? Okay. Um, thank you very much. My name is Helena Taklu. I am from Ethiopia. I'm an architect by profession and I mostly focus on interior design and sustainable architecture. Other than that, I am a co-founder of two companies. One is called Climate Change Africa, where we create the platform for the African youth to showcase their climate change adaptation and mitigation projects. Moreover, we do different research and we go around <clears throat> until now to Ethiopia and Kenya and teach about the effects of climate change. Um, other than that, we have another company called Seed Bomb Ethiopia. Uh, in Seed Bomb Ethiopia, we are teaching the farmers, the youth, the kids on how to make seed bowls. Seed bowls are easy technique of changing the way agriculture is being approached in Ethiopia or even Africa as it's lightweight than seedlings and so forth. And it has also a high growth rate than seedlings. And it, you can sense it's lightweight. You can actually use tanks and drones in order to spray it to areas that are inaccessible to human beings. And uh, one of the things we're doing with Seed Bomb is we have a factory in the southern part of Ethiopia. Uh, we are teaching the farmers on how to plant the seed walls. Uh, and we are teaching the kids on the effects of climate change, environment, and so forth, because it's important in order for Africa to, to develop, it's, import, it's important to teach the farmers. And in order for to teach the farmers or increase for productivity, we have to have our landscape restoration. And I'm more interested in landscape because as an architect, uh, you will have the opportunity to learn about landscape, what kind of plants should be planted there, how could we... <laughs> so, the, the main thing that we need to restore, especially when it comes to Africa, is our landscape because our backbone is agriculture and for agriculture to sustain and for agriculture to keep going and for us to even change the way it's being approached, we need to restore the lands, we need to focus on them. And that's what we're doing with seed bombs, like the ingredients are natural. Uh, one of the composts that we're using is, for example, chicken residues. So we use those seed bombs to restore lands. We use them to even reforest because if we can't do that, then we can't do anything further. Um, even when it comes to landscape restoration, we have to even focus on plastics. Like if a plastic is in the soil, it, can, it will take time to degrade and so forth. So we have to be able to restore our lands in order for, that would be one solution to fight climate change. And also it would create job opportunities for the youth as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, next up um, we have Anthony Oching, founder and director of Tony Wild and Biophilic Conversations. Anthony, please share with us how you see science as a link to photography and conservation. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, my, my name is Anthony Ching, uh, as Scott has just mentioned. And uh, just to, to answer that particular question is, uh, we have a lot of information as scientists all over the world, papers published and everything else, but most of this actually remains mostly either on the journals or on book or bookshelves, and uh, they're not being used either by practitioners or even our policymakers. So just as 
publishing a scientific paper is a media of first information. We are in a generation that has gone really digital very, very fast. So we need to really try as much as possible and package this scientific information uh, and the recommendations based uh, from scientific research in a very simpler way for that, so that the society can easily uh, pick up uh, uh, best practices and lesson learned from this particular scientific process. Uh, so this includes pictures. So if you're using images, uh, for me, it's uh, concerning photography. So that goes on a broader perspective. So you don't just talk about the beautiful animals. You talk about those particular beautiful animals and the issues they face. Uh, the people working towards supporting uh, continuous conservation of this particular species. You talk about films. Uh, get the stories of what people are doing locally to continue conserving um, uh, conservation because these particular short videos or pictures or images uh, can easily transfer that complex scientific paper that only me and you as a conservationist can understand. But somebody else who's not a conservationist will be like, that is just meant for the conservationist. So now, how do I help convert everyone to be a conservation philanthropist. So images or media become a very, very powerful tool to really pass that image because that, that particular information, because we, we need to accept that as much as we are advocating for conservation, we need everyone around us to take lead and actually be part of that particular process. We can't do this alone. We need everyone to be part of it. I need to explain them on a continuous basis that wildlife or nature is part and parcel of our daily routines, uh, be it waking up in the morning using water, using electricity, using firewood. All these are all interconnected with nature. And we need to communicate the science using photography, filming, and also animation in a very simpler way so that not only the young generation can understand the importance of conservation science, but also the politics, the, politi the political class, and also those who are not uh, part and parcel of the conservation society. So that's how best uh, I can really describe uh, the use of science, of media to communicate conservation science. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. And it's so, it's so enlightening to see how and most people really try to think that policies and communicating very hard jargons is a solution in itself, but we always forget that um, most ordinary citizens won't really get the gist of this information if we package it in a very technical way. So I appreciate the fact that you just shone some light on, as to why it's important to use art and media to convey these messages across. Um, and so it's already really a great session. We started off from Indonesia to India, we went to Ethiopia and out to Kenya, and they want us to introduce us uh, to Spain. Um, Fernando Morales, who is a youth restoration expert from Spain. Um, Fernando, if you don't mind, could you share with us um, how you youth are leading in community restoration in your country, and then what lessons can we learn or have you learned from your initiatives? Thank you so much for having me here, for instance. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to talk here, surrounded by so many young people, and it's really inspiring for me, for instance. Um, well, I'm Fernando Morales, and I'm, I work for the Granada University, and we are restoring locally in the southern Spain, a uh, very desertified land, because you, as you probably know, in southern Spain, there's unique desert in Europe, so we are, we are very threatened by the certification processes. And we really feel it in our local agricultural economies. So that's because we're trying to contribute locally, but also globally by restoring our degraded land. Um, well, here, uh, geography is really important, not because uh, they are so inspiring, but it's, for instance, it's really accounts, but also because they are, they, they, they are the next one who are gonna implement the solutions that we are already on the place. Here we have a very degraded uh, situation, but we can't convert it, we gotta revert it. Because we have here a very ancient local knowledge that we can use for adaptation and climate mitigation. 
So uh, our local actions here are just to teach all this ancient knowledge to the young people so that they can continue to implement all these nature-based solutions that once were implemented, but now are really abandoned. For example, we have like, a water harvesting techniques that are today abandoned, but we can easily restore our and start implementing them again. So what we're trying is to first uh, make a global context of climate emergency so that uh, we arrange a climate strike with all the local schools and it, uh, it had a, a very huge participation. Um, and so that we try to, to, capacit to capacitate these people so that they can in the next days to implement the restoration efforts. So the results are that we are developing an agroforestry system for, for the local economies and trying to do it with an adaptation approach for the days of tomorrow. So I think that we have here so many lessons that we are learning locally, but it can be implemented locally and share all this knowledge. And actually it's what I think we're doing so well in here. So um, my, Call is a global call to action and of course of, of knowledge sharing because I think we have a, very, a lot of things in common that we can uh, put to it together and, and thrive as a global community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, so next up, um, we have Alberto Borges, um, Nat Geo Explorer and founder of the Explorers Club of Kenya. Alberto, we'd like to hear from you about the importance of youth exploring their natural surroundings. Thank you so much, Scott, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction and so happy to be here to share more about what we do. So the Explorers Club of Kenya, which is the organization I founded, was based on the idea that when I was actually 17, if I could go out into the Northern Kenya landscape and discover a unique beautiful, strikingly uh, immense camel spider, what would we actually be able to discover and learn about the environment when we actually go out there with a specific purpose? So I like to call myself an environmental explorer with purpose. And uh, over the past uh, six years, I've been doing a lot of uh, research and then this later on morphed into conservation work in Northern Kenya, where Northern Kenya is a remote landscape that's mostly been marginalized over the years. People, especially the young people, they are not exposed to benefits of having uh, an environment that is sound that can sustain the local community, the local wildlife. Yet in uh, Northern Kenya, they live in a, in a landscape that's so beautiful, so vast, and largely unspoiled in terms of built environment quality. So one of the best things that I've been able to help the people of Marsabit in particular is actually by conducting student biobit events. So these are events that have been supported by National Geographic that aim to take students outdoors, bringing together local experts, be it forest rangers, wildlife rangers. In fact, in one event, we had Anton Yochien join us as a conservation photographer. And the idea is to show the young people that when we think about environment, it's not just the, the, the specific jobs of becoming a ranger. There's actually a wide field out there that uh, people can get involved in. And in order for young people to take up these roles in becoming the next conservation leaders, it's important that they love the environment. And the best way to get someone to love the environment is actually to take them out there to explore the hidden beauty of nature. And so that's what we do with uh, the Explorers Club of Kenya. We've partnered uh, with several organizations on the ground and internationally, uh, like National Geographic, the Woodspring Trust in the UK, and uh, other organizations that uh, help support some of the work we're doing. So my part in short is that in order for the future to be the way we envision it as young people, then it's up to us, the young people, to take charge right now and be part of the change we want to see. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next up, um, we'd like to um, introduce Cheyenne Zuberi, um, a member of UNEP MGCY, um, who is here to share 
the For Nature Youth Manifesto and Letter. So thank you so much For Nature for Life for giving me an opportunity to speak on this platform. So I am representing UNEP MGCY, which is the major group for youth and children, which is the official youth constituency for the UNEP. So uh, now I should start because uh, UNEP is uh, one of the main governing bodies that is uh, that is implementing the environmental policies in, around the world. So nature is our home, our food and our comfort, our culture, our health, our medicine, our safety, our recreation and our inspiration. It is our life support system to care to take care of our lives. We must care for nature, but every day we are strength, stretching the limit of the fabric of life. Recent scientific and economic reports are uh, are rising are, are raising uh, uh, alarms bells alarm bells the de uh, the degradation of nature. Seventy five percent of the land, sixty five percent of the oceans, and eighty five percent of wetlands have been negatively altered by human activity. One million species are facing extinction many with decades. We are at an extensible uh, cross uh, roads by acting urgently. Now we can prevent biodiversity, climate and environmental collapse. Now more than ever, nature needs us to pay attention to its warning signs in our economic systems, the unsustainable way we extract, produce, consume and dispose of things and the unequal way the benefits and damages of all these economic activities and distributed uh, are distributed uh, are distributed our current values and principles that underpin the system driving unlimited production uh, unli unlimited profit and unlimited growth which are which is incompatible with our limited planet we the youth says enough enough of behavior that is harmful to nature enough of short term quick fixes that do not address our deep systematic societal and environmental struggles our generation has seen many of the promises of the Millennium uh, Development Goals, the Aichi Biodiversity Targets, and the Kyoto Protocol fail. We call for individuals, nation, and the international community to deliver on its environmental commitments. We need real transformative change for humankind to realign priorities, values, behaviors, and actions. Let us reinvent our systems equitably, equitably and sustainably to succeed global agreements must protect human rights and recognize uh, nature's intrinsic and cultural values. They must steadfastly uphold the rights of the indigenous people and local communities and protect environmental defenders. Governments and corporations must be accountable uh, for, of act, for activities and degrade natural systems of, or threaten our rights to a safe and healthy environment. Action on sustainability must be based on well as well within the generations. We are calling on our leaders to safeguard and prioritize our collective future. If our generation is to have hope for future on peace and harmony from nature with nature, we need our leadership now. We want decisive actions at the start of the decade of action of the sustainability development goals and the decade on ecosystem restoration. It's time to act with for nature. Time to listen to science, time to listen to voices on the ground, time to listen to the accountable. It is time for a strong, just, courageous, inclusive and right based post 2020 global biodiversity framework and road of road to Stockholm uh, 50. We must build back better. We must put nature at the heart of decision making. We young people representing different causes, constituencies, social backgrounds and ethnicities, genders and geographics and languages have to come together. We are taking our nature as our motherland. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much for that, Panchu and Cheyenne. And I really appreciate uh, you taking time to give us intervention and most importantly, to show us how youth, young policy leaders can help link uh, the issue of nature-based solution backed policies and especially the UNF uh, major group for children and youth uh, for nature manifesto and the letter that we look forward i think to launching so thank you so much for this and to our amazing audience kindly note that you were so deliberate to allow the speakers to make their uh, three minute interventions to give you more time to contextualize what it is that they're doing in the communities and give you more time to uh, uh, like uh, form and format your questions towards them towards them or to either of them so right now we're just getting to the q a session and the format will be we just ask a very general question to our speakers and then we'll open the, the, the room for all participants to pose 
any questions you might have to our speakers, and this should last the next around 10 minutes. And so the general question that we're asking all of you amazing speakers is, why do you think it's important for us to think of a nature for life future? Anyone of you can take it on, or I can choose someone. Uh, Helena, do you wish to start it off? Okay, thank you. If I'm not mistaken, your question was, why do you think nature for life is important for the future? Yes. Okay, so um, based on what we're seeing, I think the only solution, especially when it comes to climate change, the only solution is to restore our nature because in the past we've exhausted it so well to the point we're seeing so many problems such as fires, hurricanes, and so forth. But if we are able to live a life that's based on nature, <clears throat> not only will we restore it for ourselves but we'll also restore it for our future so i believe everything that we do should be related into preserving nature because it will protect us from climate change and it will protect us from further problems that we will not be able to control at least with for example with covid we're looking for a vaccine but when it comes to climate change if we do not protect our nature what are we going to do? Like, there's no vaccine for it. So I believe it's time for us now to actually preserve our nature and think wisely on how to use it and how to pass it, not only for the next generation, but for the next, 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 next generation that's forced to come. So nature for life is very important. Thank you. Thanks, Selena. Some question uh, to you, Fernando, in around 30 seconds, please. Mm -hmm. the, uh, past uh, two weeks ago, I think, I read in a, in a recent report of Carbon Project that we have that 340 gigatons of CO2 of, of budget CO2. So that means that we have eight years to stay below the 1.5 degree, degree uh, global warming. So my first thoughts were, wow, what, what big amount of carbon do we have in the atmosphere? So it's clear already that uh, we need to cut emissions, but what would happen with that uh, amount of carbon that still remains in the atmosphere? So uh, he, this is a message of the urgency of the, of the problem, but also the necessity of nature and life, because it's just nature that can really capture these this effects of carbon. With nature-based solutions, we know that we can capture 20 billion per year uh, of carbon, of carbon, of CO2. So my big question is, are we waiting for to implement these nature-based solutions? So what I think we already need is uh, a social determination to implement all these nature-based solutions as a politicians, as a scientist, uh, as a financial muscle, and everyone. So uh, I think we cannot afford this problem without nature. Uh, we really rely on nature to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Fernando, for that. Um, again, same question for you, Aman. Why is Nature for Life um, really important a topic to discuss now? Um, thank you. As a wildlife photographer, I feel that I think the interconnectedness of humans is something that has always been so intrinsic to my Indian heritage and culture back home. Um, and I'm sure to many of more people on this panel, it's something that has always been as part of their core societal values since childhood. Um, unfortunately, the way that we've been progressing has been distancing ourselves from nature, taking our hands off the moral and social responsibility that we have towards this planet. And I feel like till a certain point ago, I didn't think I had a voice and I didn't think that that voice could count. But after talking to youth across the world, when we set up All In For Climate Action, which was an initiative where we got uh, global leaders to sign and address petitions set up by us to declare a global climate emergency along with national climate emergencies and ended up getting 1.8 million signatures, a group of youth activists taking this forward in a span of few months. We never thought that we'd meet so many people who were like-minded, who had the same focus energy and same love for the planet like we did. So the real importance of a nature for life recovery system post COVID, and in fact, in, within COVID, um, I mean, as the COVID is also going on, is 
that it's important to get back that elemental relationship between man and wild. It's important to bridge the gap between society and environment. And it's important to get back that feeling of belonging that we have to this planet. The one thing that binds all of us here together, the one thing that gets all of us together to talk about these important issues. And the one thing that gives us more than it ever takes. Indeed, that the power of our interconnectedness and how we need to consider every bit of the natural world. Thank you so much, Aman. Um, I'll move on to you, Alberto, and your views around the same question. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's that simple that everything that revolves around this planet is based on nature. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the forest and the non forest, uh, the timber and non timber products that we consume daily, everything is interconnected to the soil. And so it's important that we view our, our solutions moving forward based on nature. In the project where I work in, uh, in Northern Kenya, in the landscape I work in, as I mentioned, it's quite a dry landscape and uh, a place where water is in acute shortage. So a mountain called Mount Marsabit that's, is, that's uh, at the center of all this is the water tower that supplies water to all these desert oases. And if you happen to be in a desert and realize that the last bit of water that you have could mean you being alive and you dying, then you will quickly come to realize that it's not just about what technology we have and how we can use it to move forward. It's literally about the simple thing in life and that's just having a system which nature has already provided for us that enables us to have the, as we call them, ecosystem services. So all these are nature-based and the only way we can continue living a sustainable lifestyle is by implementing nature all the way through. Wow. Is there anything to add to what you just said? Thank you so much, Abajo. That's a lot of nuggets there. Um, and I also pose the same question to our three our remaining um, panelists. Uh, Kayan, we start with you. Why, why, is it, why is it important to think about a nature for life, future, um, and a, a very positive uh, just recovery? Um, because to us, to indigenous people specifically, nature is life. It is our life. We, what we need to understand is at the ground level, that's what we depend on, nature. That's where we get our food, our shelter, our water. And from this ground level, we can finally start to understand how protecting nature is protecting the world. Because from it, we also help to capture carbon with the trees. And that also helps with the with the climate. I think that's all that I can add, or really. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and indeed, yeah, important that nature is life and we cannot, like, uh, we cannot disturb it and expect to live sustainably. Thank you for those uh, very wise words from you. Anthony, why is it important to really think about nature for life is a really positive thing going forward? And, relating to your work in photography and linking it to science in Kenya? Uh, interesting is that we, uh, just talking about Nature for Life, we have a campaign that is going on called Wildlife is Life campaign uh, that is mainly to tell people that wildlife is cool and it's everywhere because in, in if you look at the, the, the conservation colonial structures is that people have always valued the big five, but that should not be the case. Wildlife is actually found at our doorstep, but then how do you change that narrative? Uh, so we have a campaign called Wildlife is Life, so that we, we try as much as possible and use images to showcase the, uh, the wildlife that is around you, that is trees, the insects, uh, the birds, just to, just to make sure that everybody in the society understands that we are part and parcel of, of, of the ecosystem and, and wildlife is the part of that ecosystem. So if we mess up with eating one or another, it, it, it messes all of us. Um, and, and we need to go beyond protected areas. We need to go to our doors, because I'm pretty sure all of us where we stay, there's a bird, there's, there, are, there are bird calls in the morning when you wake up. Uh, these birds are actually wildlife. But the definition of wildlife, for example, in Kenya, is attributed to tourism. But that should, that should not be the case. Wildlife is actually 
part and parcel of uh, of our day-to-day -day survival. If we put it mostly on tourism, we limit uh, the extent at which somebody else who's not passionate about wildlife to conserve uh, nature. And when I, when I talk about wildlife, quote, unquote, I'm referring to nature in short. That is both why uh, the whole interconnect, interconnectedness of wildlife, nature, environment, and everything else. So we have this particular campaign that is ongoing. And then something interesting that we, we, we do in, in terms of ensuring that nature, nature for life is for the future is uh, we have this particular amazing school program, which is called the Visual Ecological Literacy Program, where we create what is wildlife in a particular school and use that, uh, those content to, with the students to create like web chains uh, with those particular images they've taken. Now that gives each and every student a personal touch of what nature is. And then we don't do them to those who are close to national parks. We do them to those who are away uh, national parks because everywhere there's wildlife. And that is what we're trying to say. Once they understand this, as, as we grow to other careers, uh, we will be able to implement uh, our strategies or what we do, but with a mindset that we need to conserve nature and and this has not been there for a very long time and we as young people need to really uh, influence people around us as much as possible and inform them that nature is the backbone of any, any economy uh, and, and when i talk about uh, a particular economy i look at the political space uh, i look at the social space uh, and I look at the economic space, because if you talk about economies, it's all dependent on nature. If you talk about politics, it's all about management of natural resources, who gets what, where, and, and in, in what extent. Uh, so we just need to continuously put nature talks as the key, key component uh, in, every, in every part that we find ourselves in. So, what I'll just wind up is that when you're talking about these particular nature aspects, let's not act as activists. Let's act as activists, but also put some action on it. Because sometimes we, we need to draw the line where to stop activist, activism and then start the action together with everybody else within that particular society. Because as much as we can be activists, we are actually part of that particular society that is affected. So we need to be a solution for our own problems in that particular society. So nature is for us all, and it's for us life. So that's what I'll say for that. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony, indeed. And your perspectives are quite, uh, I think, at the, at the center place in my heart that we need nature and we need to think beyond um, the economic commodities, but think about the natural value of nature. And we need to protect it even beyond tourism and other values, we need to expose people to nature and we need to show them why it's important to love and protect it to thrive together. Thank you so much. And lastly, last but not least, rather, um, Cheyenne, uh, I'll pose the same question again. Um, and I know you're already leading on the campaign on for nature at UNEP. Um, mm -hmm. So why is it important and how does it, this link to a nature for life uh, future mm -hmm. for us? Okay, so I totally agree to what uh, Antonio uh, and no, Anthony said. Uh, because being by uh, my profession is I am an environmental engineer. So my great professor once said that the engineers are the ones who provide solutions. They face problems and then they provide solutions. So I think as you see, have seen during the COVID situation, the earth and our plant has a self healing capacity. So if we pro if we give the right policies, if we provide the right guidelines, we could actually uh, save our nature and this is the way this is the reason why the ndc's national retirement contributions are there because each and every country has to give the uh, national retirement contributions ndc's so that they should they need to implement those in the five years plan which uh, they have to submit in the un so if those uh, policies are implemented i think the nature is going to be sustainable more uh, more sustainable and all these mostly species and all the things will, that are being destroyed right now will be conserved. So this is all I have to say. On my, on my perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheyenne. Um, Thank you so much. 
Um, so we're running a bit short on time here, so um, I'm going to go into the next segment, um, which is the launch of our Art for Nature campaign. We are very excited that Youth for Nature, in collaboration with the Poster Toolshed and with partners like UNDP, is launching a Poster for Art and Nature project, um, which will call on youth to create and employ the power of posters for progress on nature-based solutions. Art has the power to provide a different way of communicating messages, telling stories, and motivating people. Posters have been used for over two centuries as a tool to convey anger, urgency, hope, solidarity, and agency, and they can effectively capture attention and speak in a language everyone understands. You can see the examples being shown here to give you a sense of the potential of posters to speak to nature, climate, and biodiversity. The Art for Nature project will be an ongoing initiative with the first space focused on creating posters for showcasing at the 2021 UNFCCC and the Convention on Biodiversity COPs. Longer term, we're interested in building a global, expansive, and growing collection of youth-created posters for nature that can support different projects, campaigns, and be used for advocacy and education in schools, public places, protests, exhibits, and so on. We are excited to use this medium to amplify the voices of youth, to inspire people to take action, and to contribute to critical efforts to fix our relationship with nature. In the coming months, we plan to hold a poster workshop webinar, uh, launch the detailed brief, and open the call for submissions for our first wave of collection. We invite you to join the initiative by going to youthfornature.org to learn more and to sign up to be kept up to date. We look forward to seeing the incredible creativity and perspectives of youth. Thank you guys. And now I believe we are going to have um, a couple poll questions for you all. Okay, which of these are nature-based solutions? Dietary changes, solar power, creating green roofs in urban environments, um, or biomimicry, which is a practice that learns from and mimics the strategies found in nature to solve challenges. Um, and so the correct answer would be um, creating green roofs in urban environments. Um, so, Addie, would you like to put up the next one? Looks like every, most people got that one, right? Um, so the next poll question, how much are the estimated global benefits and ecosystem services from nature-based solutions focused on climate? Um, so for US dollar, um, 150, 150 million, 170 million, 150 billion, or 170 billion? I'll give everyone a second. Okay, so the correct answer for that um, is um, 170 billion uh, US dollars. So you'll, the, we're all gonna save a whole bunch of money. Um, Thanks. Thanks so much for mm -hmm. the scout. And, and what a wonderful session we've had again. I think we agree that it's been quite insightful. We've been exposed to so many initiatives on what is happening on the ground, but we've also learned on why it's important to be one with nature. And now I wish to take us on a very short journey. Uh, very, the very first uh, at Youth for Nature that we are doing with a global audience. So kindly welcome to have a very nice nature themed meditation exercise. So if you don't mind, I invite you to be on, on video, but mute your, your audio. And um, I would like to invite you for a short meditation exercise, exercise around nature. After all these diverse uh, actions shared today, let us take a moment to reflect and connect with our bodies and minds. Would you kindly close your eyes? Take a deep breath in and slowly breathe out. A deep breath in and slowly breathe again out. A final deep breath in. And as you breathe out, try to release all the anxieties, all the bad emotions, and think about the best future you can imagine for us. Um, with your eyes closed, think about the chaotic world we see every day. The climate emergency, the ravaging fires consuming forests and biodiversity, the angry floods, Hurricanes displacing and killing many people, destroyed ecosystems and oceans choking in plastic. Acknowledge those feelings that are going in your body, be it anxiety, be it anger, depression, hopeful, or that you are determined. 
Now think about the role of young people and communities and what we've done and how you've played over the years to reverse these cares. This could be the power of activism. It could be starting local initiatives, leading on research and innovation, shaping policies, or rising to positions of power. This is something that we are doing and we need to be proud of. Now think about the future that you're fighting for and the warmth of friends and family around you. Your actions matter because we're in this together. Our shared humanity for our shared home. Take a final deep breath in and exhale slowly and release all the positive vibes you got around nature-based solutions, about youth action, about the power of communities, and about what we can achieve if we come together and if we respect the natural rules of nature. And now open your eyes. Thank you so much. How about you, Scott, to wrap us up? Thank you, Kaluki. That was really great. Um, so for our, uh, on a final note, um, we'd like ev to thank everyone for attending our session, especially our amazing speakers. Um, and we'd like to thank UNDP as well. Um, we hope that you all were able to take away the importance of nature-based solutions in the fight against the climate and ecological crises and are motivated to keep, um, to continue to advocate and take action. Um, we've had some great examples of what young people are capable of, had important insights and inspiration, and it's clear that young people need to be at the table as decision makers, seeing as they are truly the leaders and visionaries in this fight. Um, this is just one in a series of events leading up to the UNFCCC COP26 and the CBD COP15, uh, and we call on you to join us in keeping up momentum and solidarity to ensure that nature, youth, and frontline communities are front and center in, the, in global conversations, action, and resourcing. To stay in touch with us, please sign up on our website or write us at hello um, at youthfornature.org. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the Nature for Life Hub. Thank you to our friends at Youth for Nature and the incredible youth panelists in that session. You have set the stage perfectly for our final day of focusing on local action. In a few short minutes, we will begin one of the UN's flagship events, the Equator Prize. You can find the live session on UNDP's YouTube account or at Equator Initiative on Twitter. Additionally, you can visit natureforlifehelp.org to join this live event. Stay tuned.